In this segment, uh, we'll look at pointers to structs. C allows pointers to almost anything, and we'll see more and more complex forms of pointer or types of pointer in the next several segments. We'll also do a relatively long review block on typedef, arrays of structs, and curly brace list initializations. One declares a pointer to a struct type in the same way as other pointers, by taking what would be a normal struct variable declaration and adding a declarative asterisk in front of it, as we do uh, here, for instance, on line 23. So PS is a pointer to a struct of student type. As with other pointers, PS is particular about its target type. It can, it can only point to structs of student type, not any other struct type. Now, a review here. Recall from prior study that one sets up a user-defined struct type via the uh, typedef syntax shown here on lines 7 through 11. The typedef makes student a type, not a variable. And we use the student type to declare other variables to be of the struct type shown in the typedef. On lines 19 through 22, for instance, we uh, use student to declare our pointer ps, um, but also to declare a couple of struct variables s1 and s2 here, and uh, in fact an entire array of structs uh, students uh, right here. Recall also that one may create arrays of structs like students, and each element of such array is a full struct in its own right, as illustrated in the diagram of students up here. And finally, recall that uh, complex variable types, either structs or arrays, may be initialized with curly brace enclosed lists of values, as shown here uh, in the example. Uh, to initialize a struct, you list the values of its fields in the curly braces, comma separated, in the same order that the fields were declared. So we've got one here corresponding with ID and Bob with name and, and so forth. These values are automatically assigned into the new struct variable as initial contents. So S1 will have these initial contents. For arrays, you list the values of the array elements one after another, comma separated. And for an array of a simple type, like uh, an int, say, those are simple values. But for an array of structs, each element is, in turn, a nested curly brace enclosed list of values for each struct element of the array of structs. So students will have the initial contents shown up here in the diagram because of the curly brace list here. Arrays and structs can be nested within, an, within one another in arbitrarily deep patterns, and curly brace initializers may be correspondingly nested as needed to match the arrays or the structs being initialized. Also, the curly brace lists may omit some values, providing only values for the first few fields of a struct or the first few elements of an array. They may not skip values, however. Once they omit any value, they must omit all the remaining ones, and the ones that are omitted remain simply uninitialized. And while we're at it, an array declaration may leave out the dimension, showing only empty brackets, and letting the length of the initializa initialization list determine the dimension instead. This is not the same usage of empty brackets, by the way, as in a parameter list, where empty brackets signifies pointer. Arrays declared in normal variable blocks with unspecified dimension like this are still arrays. They're not pointers. Their dimension is just determined through other means, like the length of the curly brace list. At this point, students usually ask if this curly brace notation can also be used in assignments in the code instead of only in initializations. And uh, sadly, the answer is no. Um, some think that uh, Kernahan and Ritchie, who designed C, uh, should be shot for this omission. It would be very convenient to be able to do that. Uh, programmers used to JavaScript or other scripting languages where either curly brace notation or th things very similar to it in syntax are, are routinely used for general assignments. Uh, programmers used to those languages will find it really irritating to have to assign the fields of a large struct one dull assignment statement at a time. I guess that's what you get with a 1970 vintage programming language. Now, you may assign the address of a struct into a struct pointer in the usual way, as on line 25 here. Use an ampersand, copy it into the pointer. The result will be as shown here with PS pointing to S1. Or you can assign the name of an array of structs into the pointer, as in the loop initialization down here on line 30. 
and in this case the pointer would point to the uh, first element of the entire array. A struct pointer's target is exactly one struct, not just a field in the struct, nor an entire array of structs, but a single struct, sort of symbolized with that uh, oval I got going there. Dereferencing a struct pointer thus results in one struct. After dereferencing, we may do the usual dot notation to pick one field of the dereferenced pointer, as in the first expression in line 26's printf here, where we use a uh, star ps, which would be s1, and then dot name to pick the uh, name field of s1, which is what we want to print out. This two-step process, dereferencing a struct pointer and then picking a field, is very common. But the way we just did it is rather tedious. Especially irritating is the need for parentheses around the pointer dereference down here. Those aren't just for emphasis. They're required. Dereferencing a pointer is an operation in C, just like plus or multiply or bang or what have you, and it thus has a precedence. Curiously, the dot used to pick a field is also an operation with its own precedence. We'll find, by the way, that C interprets a great many things as operators and operations, even things like array indexing and field choosing. The problem here is that the field choosing dot has higher precedence than the dereferencing star. So without overwriting parentheses, star ps.name would be interpreted as star of ps.name, which is meaningless. And by the way, a side note for you Java or JavaScript programmers, if you're tempted to write something like uh, ps.name by itself, thus, be aware that you cannot use a period operation directly on a struct pointer, the way you can on an object reference in Java or JavaScript. Those languages have no dereferencing star. They implicitly dereference. So in Java or JavaScript or others like them, ps.name is automatically interpreted as star ps.name, but not in C. That's not allowed syntax. So with all that, we're left needing a more elegant way to write dereference and pick a field. And this is given by the arrow operator, which is typed as a dash and a greater than sign, but it's meant as a single arrow. And you can see we're using that throughout the uh, example here, all over the place. So it's pretty common. PS arrow ID, for instance, is a synonym for star PS, parenthesis, dot ID. The arrow is a single operator, but it represents two steps, dereference and then pick a field. So the rest of this code makes use of these ideas. First, uh, printing the fields of PS via uh, or S1, I'm sorry, via PS. So we have Bob has ID1 and GPA3, for instance. And then checking to see if PS and S2, or if uh, S1, I should say, and S2 are equal. But that comparison done right here has several interesting aspects. Um, we're doing pointers evidently here, but first let's recall some things from prior lectures. Structs may be assigned directly into one another. I can write S1 equals S2, but they may not be directly compared. I can't write S1 equal equal S2. For comparisons, you must write code that hand checks each pair of fields. And a good reason for this, by the way, is that structs may hold a wide variety of field types. And the correct rule for equality comparison is not always clear. In our student struct, for instance, we would use strcomp for comparison of the names f rather than directly comparing the care array contents, which, which might actually differ after the terminating nulls. Uh, so we really need a handcrafted equality checker. Another reason, by the way, that it's hard for the compiler to automatically check structs for equality has to do with the bus error concept from a prior lecture. The field GPA, for example, a double, must begin on a 4-byte or 8-byte boundary, depending on the CPU. But since name is an odd number of bytes long, the byte that comes right after name is unlikely to be on a 4- or 8-byte boundary. In this case, the compiler automatically adds a few extra pad bytes between the end of the name and the beginning of GPA 
so that GPA starts at a properly divisible address. Now, those pad bytes hold just random junk, and you don't notice them because they're not part of any field, but an automated comparison for equality between two structs would need to know not to compare the random content pad bytes. So any way you look at it, struct comparison requires more logic than just looking at the raw content of the two structs. So with that digression, we now look back and see that we have to do a hand comparison of student structs in the is equal method on line 13 and through to 16. We pass it two student structs, and then we compare each pair of fields, IDs and GPAs and a stir comp for a name, and we return true only if the combined and of all the field pair equality checks is true. So that's fairly straightforward, but we're doing this by passing the addresses of the two structs in question into pointer parameters SA and SB and then using the arrow operator. And so in effect we're using these to reach back into the main program to access S1 and S2 and compare their contents. But, and, and be sure you see that when we passed PS and ampersand S2, those are passing the address of S1 and of S2. Now, we're not modifying S1 and S2, we're just comparing them for equality. So why will we pass pointers instead of just passing the structs as normal value parameters? To see why, consider how many bytes long a student struct is. The ID field is maybe 4 bytes, the name array is 21 bytes, GPA is another 8 bytes, that's 33 bytes in all, plus probably some pad bytes. And students a small struct. Passing S1 and S2 by value would make copies of S1 and S2 in the parameters, and that would require 66 bytes or more bytes of copying. But if we use pointer parameters, passing just addresses, that's a total of two four-byte pointers, or addresses, about one-eighth as much data. And again, for a bigger struct, the difference is even more dramatic. It's very common to see structs passed via pointers for this reason, even if the function is not going to modify the actual parameters. And then finally, let's look at the loop on line 30 here. See what's going on with that. It walks PS down the student's array, just like the loop from our prior lecture. But each element of students is a struct. So here's question one. How much does the address in PS change when we do the uh, PS++ plus plus increment here? Pause and think a bit about that. Set PS pointing to the first element there like that. So what we'd get after the initialization. OK, and then uh, the answer coming back from the pause, is it increases by 33 bytes, or, or maybe more if there are pads, which is the size of an entire student struct. Technically, it could be even 36 or 40 bytes if you count the pad bytes. So it does this kind of a jump, in other words. It may be surprising that a single plus-plus operation can cause a large jump in the pointer's address, but that's what it takes to jump to the next struct in the array. Now, in closing here, a bit of external research, please. Look more closely into the rules surrounding this curly brace initialization stuff, which I'm going to guess a number of students are perhaps not that familiar with. And I have a question. Can I initialize a two-dimensional array, let's just say an array of ints, uh, 3 by 4, using curly brace notation? And if so, what does the initialization look like to, let's say, initialize it to all zeros? And can I do the initialization of that 2D array with just one curly brace pair? So go away and do a little bit of external research. You won't get this from the lecture, and see what you come up with. And the answer is, in, uh, after the pause here, yeah, you can. And the initialization might look like what you see here in the transcript. Uh, in the, uh, I'll drop into the uh, document as well here, like that. Each row of the sub of the array is a subarray. Each, uh, individual row of four columns, and thus each gets its own curly brace block, and there are three of them, one for each row in the three by four array. But as it turns out, the inner curly brace blocks are uh, actually optional. One may also write this and uh, get the same effect. 
the 12 zeros will automatically be grouped into rows.